Welcome to the NASA Engineering and Safety Center NESC Shock and Vibration Training Program. My name is Tom Irvine and I'll be your instructor. And today's unit will be a sign vibration. So I hope you'll enjoy this presentation. So let's talk about uh, sign vibration and some of the things we have to consider are the amplitude metrics. So here we have a sine function, and it's just a one-cycle sine function. And the y-axis is the amplitude, and the x-axis is the time in seconds. Now, this particular sine function has an amplitude of 1. So that's the amplitude. Then there's an RMS, that's root mean square value, is 0 0.707. Now, that's equal to the square root of 2 divided by 2. So sometimes when we were discussing sine functions, we would use the RMS, the root mean square metric. Then other times we, we would use the zero to peak amplitude metric. Or in some cases, particularly for displacement, we would use the peak to peak amplitude metric. And it really doesn't matter so much which of these three we are using. But the important point is, is that if we're conveying this information uh, to some other engineer or vice versa, both parties need to understand what the convention is for expressing the amplitude metric. So we need to be very explicit when we're discussing sine amplitude metrics. And sometimes, for example, the zero to peak amplitude will be called the single amplitude, and the peak to peak amplitude will be called the double amplitude. So does sine, sine or sinusoidal vibration ever occur in rocket vehicles? And the answer is, well, yes, it, it does. Now, uh, some of you that are viewing this presentation, you may work in other industries, maybe automotive or ships or aircraft or, or semiconductor fabs or, or whatever machinery. Uh, it, it's always good to have cross-training. And, and the more you understand about uh, sinusoidal rocket vibration, the better off you'll be uh, no matter what sort of projects you're working on. So here's a, some examples. On the left we have the space shuttle. Now the space shuttle had two solid rocket motor strap-on boosters and these were uh, four segments. And then for the Ares program, for the Constellation uh, Ares 1 program, these boosters, one of these boosters would be at, given a fifth segment and so it would be elongated. Now, as it turns out, there's a combustion cavity inside each of these motors, and it runs uh, pretty much the full length of the vehicle. It's uh, you know, in, inside the, uh, the, the cylinder there. And it turns out that for the Space Shuttle 4 segment booster, this thrust oscillation frequency was 15 hertz. And then for the Constellation slash Ares 1 vehicle, the 5 segment booster, it would have been uh, 12 hertz because we have a longer combustion cavity and the uh, pressure oscillation frequency uh, goes down to 12 hertz in this case. And, and what, what happens is as the, as the propellant is burning, there's different vortex shedding and other effects that get set up in these rocket motors, and that produces standing waves. And those standing waves, these standing pressure waves, cause vibration. Now, in the case of, of the space shuttle, these two motors were offset from where the astronauts would be and where the payload would be inside the cargo bay. So it was somewhat of an issue, but maybe not too much of an issue. But on the Ares-1 uh, vehicle, which never actually flew, the astronauts and whatever equipment or payloads uh, that they, they would have carried, uh, that would have been in line with the oscillation. So that was, that was a big concern and a big issue for the Ares-1 program. And there was different uh, concepts uh, were uh, pursued and studied in order to mitigate that thrust oscillation. But then the program was canceled, unfortunately. But uh, for the space launch system, the new SLS vehicle, solid rocket boosters will also be used uh, as strap-on boosters. So that issue may be coming uh, back up again. Now here's a Delta II launch vehicle. And it has a liquid engine, a first stage. And it has a MECO event. That's the main engine cutoff. And that produces a sinusoidal transient at 120 hertz. And this could be a high force input to the spacecraft. So when the coupled loads types analyses were uh, being performed or 
then it would be necessary to look at this as an event. And then the payload must be designed and tested accordingly. Now in previous units we've talked about the Pegasus XL launch vehicle. And this is a three-stage solid fuel vehicle. It's carried aloft to nearly 40,000 feet underneath an L-1011 carrier aircraft. Then it undergoes a drop transient for about five seconds. And while the Pegasus is still attached or mounted underneath the L-1011, it's during the captive carry, it bows downward uh, due to the effects of gravity. Then when it's released, it responds as a free, free beam and undergoes an oscillation, a fundamental bending frequency of about 9 to 10 hertz. And that depends both on the mass and stiffness of the Pegasus launch vehicle, as well as those same properties for the payload. And here's an accelerometer time history. This is actual flight accelerometer data from a particular uh, Pegasus mission. And you can see that it has a, the envelope has a damped, it's, it's a damped envelope with a, a negative exponential uh, function there which controls the, uh, the, the damping. And then it has a, a sinusoidal oscillation, in this case 9.9 .9 hertz with damping of 1%. And we actually did some curve fitting to another uh, piece of Pegasus data in a previous unit. So you can go back and review the previous units uh, if you'd like to uh, perform this type of curve fitting yourself. And again, we po also pointed out that uh, since this oscillation is about 10 hertz, then the payload's own uh, mounted natural frequency, as if the payload were mounted as a cantilever beam, should be 20 hertz or higher in order to comply with the octave rule and to uh, mitigate the potential for dynamic coupling. Now we're going to move on to another type of oscillation, and this is called POGO. And this happens in vehicles that have liquid engines. And there's all sorts of different uh, types of POGOs that can occur. But we're going to talk about the classic um, POGO mode. And this occurs when there is some sort of coupling between the first longitudinal resonance of the vehicle and the fuel flow to the rocket engines. So for a liquid engine vehicle, there's the oxidizer and then there's the liquid fuel. And those fuels need to be pumped into the combustion cavity or combustion chamber, I should say, via turbo pumps. So imagine uh, for some reason there's some perturbation in the turbo pumps uh, provided flow. And that uh, perturbation happens to occur at the natural frequency, the longitudinal natural frequency of the vehicle. Well, then the vehicle is going to start responding in its longitudinal mode, and that's going to further aggravate the, uh, this perturbed flow, this uneven flow from the propellant feed system. Now, that it, it kind of turns into what, what came first, the chicken or the egg, because uh, maybe for some reason the first longitudinal mode was excited uh, by one means or another, and that itself caused the perturbation in the fuel flow. Uh, but regardless, the, the, one, the one affects the other, and those can uh, uh, continue reinforcing one another and, and cause a, a real vibration problem for launch vehicles. Now, POGO, uh, also it's, it's the name of a, uh, a children's uh, playground type toy, a spring-loaded uh, uh, contraption that they uh, bounce up and, and, da and down on as well. And that's kind of how this uh, pogo phenomena uh, derived its name, because the pogo sticks, a uh, child's toy, uh, predated the observed pogo effect in, in, in liquid fuel rocket vehicles. So here's astronaut Michael Collins, a quote from him. And he's best known for the Apollo 11 mission, uh, because on Apollo 11, uh, that was the mission where Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin descended in the lunar module to the moon and were the first two men to set foot on the moon. Meanwhile, astronaut Collins orbited the moon in the command service module. Now, prior to Apollo 11, astronaut Collins was on the Gemini program. And Gemini means twins, and there were two astronauts that would go up in each Gemini spacecraft. And uh, Collins noted that the first stage of the Titan II vibrated longitudinally so that someone riding on it would be bounced up and down as if on a pogo stick. The vibration was at a relatively high frequency, about 11 cycles per second, which also means 11 hertz. 
with an amplitude of plus or minus 5g in the worst case. So he's, he's very precise about this information. He's very clear about the amplitude metric. Uh, and another way of stating that amplitude at the zero to peak acceleration was 5g's. Now this is sort of a kind of a funny quote in a way, uh, not just because of the pogo stick analogy, but astronaut Collins says that the vibration was at a relatively high frequency, about 11 hertz. Well, if we're designing and testing an avionics box to uh, withstand a pyrotechnic shock event, well, in that case, the energy might be well above 100 hertz or well above 1,000 hertz, even on upwards to 10,000 hertz. But for an astronaut, 11 hertz is a relatively high frequency, even though it would be a relatively low frequency for an avionics box. And, and this actually has a, a variety of consequences. One is, of course, there's the, the discomfort and the stress placed upon the astronauts' bodies. But, but also, uh, you know, back, back particularly in this, in this uh, era, uh, there was limited telemetry bandwidth, and the astronauts actually had to read off the instrument panels and uh, broadcast that via radio links down to mission control. Well, if an astronaut is vibrating 11 hertz with an amplitude of plus or minus 5G, those instruments might start to get uh, very blurry. Uh, so that was a concern. And it turns out it's actually fairly straightforward to to mitigate or attenuate the effects of POGO. And, and, and probably the best solution is to have accumulators in the propellant feed lines. Then there's other ways as well. Uh, some people have uh, proposed using different sorts of Helmholtz resonators and, and other techniques as well. So here's a, a different vehicle. This is, a, sometimes I call this my favorite flight anomaly. This is actual flight accelerometer data from a, an a unnamed launch vehicle. And it had a solid motor. And during stage one burnout, uh, the thrust level was tailing off. And there was a control system oscillation. And as a result of this control system oscillation, and by the way, this was a gimbal nozzle, which had a thrust vector control system. So in other words, the nozzle could be rotated as the motor burned uh, to direct the, the thrust in, in, in certain angles uh, or attitudes or orientations. And that was to provide steering to the vehicle so it could go on its correct maneuver and also to adjust for anything like the three sigma winds or other perturbations that might occur. Well, what, what happens is, is, the, is the thrust is tailing off at, at, at motor, stage one motor burnout. Then, then the whole control system gain is, uh, is being reduced, and, and that nozzle has to work, has to move in, into increasingly higher rotations in order to provide the same amount of, of steering capability. And this actually was a, a flaw in the software control algorithm um, because it, it, it probably would have been better if the, if the control algorithm had said, hey, we're, we're, we're starting into uh, stage one burnout now. We're not going to be able to use thrust to, to steer the vehicle anymore. Therefore, we just ought to shut the system off. <laughs> but, but anyways, the, 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 the thrust contract thrust vector control system was still trying to be active even though the thrust was decreasing rapidly and it created this oscillation and this actually has two sinusoidal frequencies one at 12.5 hertz and then a three times harmonic at 37.5 hertz well at this particular measurement location the amplitude was only about uh, plus and minus 2g which maybe isn't so much but uh, uh, further up the vehicle uh, with a payload fairing and payload location uh, for that particular station further on up there was kind of a moment arm amplification effect and it, it actually created a much higher uh, bending type frequency up at those locations. So again this was a tail wags dog oscillation and uh, the, the, the problem was fixed for the, for the next flight. Uh, this, this was a vehicle that was launched several times. Uh, just another example here, this was a re-entry vehicle for an unmanned vehicle and it had a gas generator device which was had a little propellant uh, that was burned off to provide exhaust gas to drive a little turbine and then that uh, energy from the turbine was used to drive uh, some, some movable fins for the re-entry maneuver. 
and this produced a 1600 hertz oscillation. So the nearby avionics needed to be designed and tested accordingly. So here's just a, a simple sine function. It's uh, 10 hertz, 10 cycles per second, duration 2 seconds, amplitude 1g. This is just some made up data as opposed to being measured data. So imagine if we were to digitize this signal. It actually is digitized data, but it's represented in a series of connected dots. And imagine if we took this amplitude and divide it into a, a series of bins. Uh, the bins are consecutive. They do, do, do not overlap. And then we counted up each number of points that fell within each bin. Well, if we, we could then make a plot that's called a histogram, or you may be familiar with the, the cousin of a histogram, which is a probability density function. So here we have, for that particular sine function, we have its histogram. Now the amplitude bins are actually along the x-axis. So this could be the acceleration g. And then the counts are the number of points that fall within each bin. Now for a pure sine function, this is what we get for the histogram. It's called a bathtub curve, which you probably have a bathtub in your home or your apartment. And there are several uh, consequences to this. One is it shows that the sine vibration, it, that tends to, to remain at the either the negative extreme or at the positive extreme with a fairly uh, rapid transition in between. Now eventually we're going to be doing random vibration. And when we get to uh, random vibration, in some cases it, it will have a normal distribution. And a normal distribution will be kind of a bell-shaped curve. So imagine we superimpose the bell curve onto the sine plot. And as a consequence of that, uh, the fact that random has a different, fundamentally different histogram than does sine, that means there really is no good direct way to compare sine vibration versus random vibration in order to determine which is more severe, which is worse. But later on, we're going to be getting into the topic of rain flow fatigue cycle counting for the response accelerations, uh, for example, for a spring mass system as if, as if it were or for the cases where it was excited either by a sign or by random base input. And once we do our cycle counting for the response acceleration time histories, then we can kind of sort of indirectly uh, compare the damage potential effects of sign versus random. And that will be in a, in a later unit. Okay, here we have some just basic formulas to describe sign vibration. So let's take displacement. This will be lowercase x as a function of time t. And that's equal to uppercase x, which would be the displacement amplitude. And let's go ahead and call it the zero to peak displacement amplitude times the sine function. And then in the argument, we have omega. That's the frequency in radians per time, typically radians per second. And then we have time in seconds. Now, this could be for a base input. It could be for an applied force. It could be for a response. And, and all the equations that we're going to show on this slide can be for any of those cases. So in order to get the velocity, we must take the derivative. So x is going to turn into the velocity v as a function of time. This omega comes out of the argument as we differentiate or take the derivative, comes out here. This x, the zero to peak displacement, comes down here sine changes over to cosine, and in the argument we still have omega t. So that's the velocity. Now to take the acceleration, we take the derivative of velocity. So the velocity v turns into the acceleration t. Now this omega here comes out, gets multiplied against this omega, and we get omega squared. Taking the derivative from cosine to sine, we get a negative polarity. And then we have the same argument. So these are the basic three equations for sine vibration. Now, as we, as we go on to the next slides, we're not going to be so interested in whether we have sine or cosine or whether it's positive or negative polarity. Rather, we're just going to be concerned about these amplitudes here. So let's talk about the peak sine values. 
So we're going to reference the peak sign values to the peak displacement in, the, in this first table here. So that peak displacement will be uppercase x here. The peak velocity will be omega x. And the peak acceleration will be omega squared x. And it turns out these formulas have quite a few consequences, especially when we get into shaker table testing. Now we could also look at this the other way around. So let's take acceleration and represent it by uppercase A. This will be the peak acceleration. In order to get velocity, the peak velocity, we divide by omega. And then to get the peak displacement, we divide the acceleration by omega squared. So those are two tables uh, for looking at the peak sign values for each of the three amplitude metric types. So this does have consequences for vibration testing. So let's, let's say we have a displacement. We need to calculate the displacement for a 10G sign excitation. So this will be our base input uh, on our shaker table to some test article. We're going to start at the very bottom here. So if we have a 1,000 hertz 10G sign signal, that has a negligibly low displacement amplitude. Uh, to, to the visible eye, this would almost be undetectable. If we decrease the frequency by an order of magnitude, now we're down at 100 hertz, then we have 9.78 times 10 to the 3 inches displacement. And if we go down to 50, we're getting about, uh, uh, let's see if I can say this right, four hundredths of an inch. And then down to 20 hertz. And then once we get down to 20 hertz, excuse me, down to 10 hertz here, this is 10 hertz, we have almost an inch of displacement. And by the way, these are each of these are zero to peak displacements. So at 10 hertz, we get a one, nearly a one inch zero to peak displacement. And this can, be, this can start to be a problem for shaker tables. Uh, some shaker tables may have that stroke ability, but others this may start to be exceeding the stroke limit of the shakers. Now if we down, went down to 1 hertz, it would be almost 100 inches zero to peak, and a tenth of a hertz, almost 1,000 inches zero to peak. And as far as I know, there are no shaker tables whatsoever that can do these types of displacements down at uh, 1 hertz 10G, uh, they just aren't made as far to the best of my knowledge. Now there are some kind of large seismic shakers used for shaking scale models of buildings that uh, the earthquake engineering people use, but, uh, but still those would be much less than 100 inches <laughs> zero to peak displacement. So this is the reason that any time we have a component, an avionics component test specification, it will typically have a lower limit of 10 to 20 hertz to control displacement. And this would be the case for electromagnetic or electrodynamic shakers. Now, I know there's some mill standard 810 type specs that maybe go down to 5 hertz or even lower. And in some cases, to achieve those displacements, those types of tests need to be, need to be performed on a pneumatic shaker or on a hydraulic shaker that that uh, is suitable for low frequency testing and which has a high stroke limit. This just shows an example of a hand calculation in English units. So let's say we have a 2.5 G 25 hertz oscillation. So this is the acceleration. It's 2.5 Gs. Now we, we want to calculate the peak, peak displacement. And this will be the zero to peak displacement. So what we would do is we would take this 25 hertz plug it into the omega here. Of course, we have to multiply by 2 pi. Take the square, multiply by 2.5 g. That's this amplitude here. And then we, we need a scale factor. This is 386 inches per second squared per g. So anytime we're going between inches or inches per second in g or vice versa, whatever, some place or another, we have to account for a factor of 386. And in this case, we would have a zero to peak displacement of about uh, 0 0.04 inches or four hundredths of an inch. So that's just a method for doing the hand calculation example, I should say. And in the next couple of slides, we'll be going to the vibration data GUI package, and I'll show you that this function is built in to the GUI package. But it's, it's good for you just to maybe try this once on your own as a hand calculation. 
some important relationships here. We talk about the RMS value, root mean square value. And for pure sine vibration, if we multiply the RMS by the square root of 2, we get the peak value. Or if we take the peak value and divide by square root of 2, we get the RMS value. And those are very neat and tidy relationships for sine vibration. They work out very well. But they do not apply to random vibration, however. So when we get to random vibration, we're going to be in the realm of probability and statistics, and we're going to, we're going to be talking about three sigma peaks and four sigma peaks, and even in some cases a five sigma peak. So just, just keep this in mind that this set of equations that you're already familiar with only apply to pure sign. So now we're going to talk about a single degree of freedom systems subjected to base excitation. Now the base excitation, it could be a sine vibration, which we've been talking about in this unit. And it could also be in any arbitrary shock pulse or vibration, uh, whatever might, you, you might have. So we'll, we'll, let's start talking about this. So here we have a mass M, a stiffness K. This is Hooke's Law stiffness. We have a damper or dash pot represented by the, the letter C. Base acceleration will be y double dot. x double dot will be the, ma the mass acceleration. So x double dot is the absolute acceleration of the mass. Now this model will be used over and over and over again as we go through these series of webinars. So we need to derive the governing equation of motion and we need a free body diagram. So hopefully you remember doing these uh, from maybe you took a course in dynamics uh, when you went to college. So here's our mass M. There's two forces acting on this mass M. One is the force transmitted through the spring, so that's stiffness K. Then we have the base displacement Y minus the dis absolute displacement of the mass X. Then we also have this uh, damping force here, so we have the letter C, the viscous damping coefficient. And this is multiplied in parentheses times the base velocity minus the absolute velocity of the mass. So we take Newton's laws, sum the forces, that equals mass times the absolute acceleration. That, e that mass times acceleration is equal to these two forces. Well, it turns out for many of the problems that we're going to be analyzing, we know what y double dot is. We know what the base acceleration is. But to solve this equation, we need to know what the base velocity and base displacement are. And it turns out we can uh, integrate or, or, or double integrate our acceleration to get those, but it actually turns out a little tricky because we don't necessarily know what the initial velocity or initial displacement were. There's different offset and ski slope effects that occur when we try and uh, integrate acceleration. We'll talk about more about those later. So we're going to do something a little different here. We're going to define a relative displacement Z. So Z is going to be equal to X minus Y, so absolute mass displacement minus displacement of base. So we take this relative displacement, and it's uh, we can also take the various derivatives for the first and second derivatives. We're going to plug into this equation of motion here, and then we're going to uh, do, do a couple of simplification steps. We're going to come up with this equation here. Now, when I teach this course live, I like to really drill the students and ask them if they know what type of equation this is. And I'll just tell you the answer in here. It's a second order ordinary differential equation. It has constant coefficients. It's linear, and it's non-homogeneous. And it's non-homogeneous because we have y double dot here. Now, we're going to do another simplification step. It turns out these two terms in parentheses, uh, we, we can substitute other terms for those. So let's take our viscous damping coefficient C divided by our mass M. And that's going to be equal to 2 times our viscous damping ratio, or modal, damp or modal damping ratio times omega sub n, which is the natural frequency in radians per second. Then k over m, stiffness over mass, is equal to the natural frequency in radians per second squared. 
So let's make those substitutions. And then here's an equation that's a little more neat and tidy for us to proceed forward with. And you can see, again, it's a second order linear, non-homogeneous, ordinary, ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients. Well, if y double dot is something well defined uh, in terms of a de deterministic function like a sine function, because after all we are using sine functions or analyzing sine vibration in this unit. If, it, if, it's, if, it, if y double dot is, is, is a function as simple as a sine function, we can use Laplace transforms to exactly solve this governing equation motion. Well, it turns out that's all well and good. In some cases, we do have sine vibration, as we've already discussed in this unit. But in our case, in many cases, as we move forward through this series of webinars, y double dot is going to vary arbitrarily with time. So I'm actually going to show you the method for solving this equation where y double dot varies arbitrarily with time. And what we're going to do is we're going to solve for the relative deflection z, and then we're also going to solve for the relative acceleration z double dot. And once we know that, we can add on to our, our, our y double dot, that's the base acceleration, which we already know, and that will give us the absolute acceleration of the mass, x double dot. So this is a really good way to solve this type of equation. But again, the complexity may be that y double dot is a function that varies arbitrarily with time. Now, there was an engineer named Dave Smallwood at Sandia Labs, and he came up with a, an equation to solve this in a very efficient manner. And Smallwood's algorithm is commonly used in, in shock response spectrum calculations. Well, as it turns out, that same formula used in shock response spectrum calculations, that same numerical engine can be used for steady state vibration or um, any vibration whatsoever in terms of uh, single degree frame response to base excitation. So let's see what we have here. So now we're going to assume that y double dot, it may be a sine function, but maybe it's arbitrary. So one of the intermediate steps we need to do is define a unit impulse response function. And for the homogeneous case, it's equal to this term here. It's lowercase h, h as a function of time. 1 over the damped natural frequency, you can see that at the bottom of the slide, the damped natural frequency is equal to the natural frequency times the square root of 1 minus the viscous damping ratio squared. Then we have an exponential term that kind of controls the, the amplitude decay, the envelope of the, in other words, it, it controls the envelope of this sine function here. So that's our unit impulse response function. Now to, to move forward so we can solve for z and, and also for z double dot, we need to apply this to a convolution integral. Or you may have heard these referred to as Duhamel integral. So here we have our base acceleration, y double dot. It's a function of tau. So we've changed the time variable there. But that's our base acceleration. Then we have from our impulse response function, we get this term here. Notice that we've introduced a delay into the time argument. And then the sign here, again, with its delayed time. We're going to then uh, integrate this with res respect to the tau, which is the delay, from 0 to t. And then this will give us our relative deflection or relative displacement. And then something similar can be done for the acceleration as well. It turns out, however, that if we want to write a program to do this calculation, it can be very inefficient numerically. It takes too much time, too much CPU time, too much steps on a computer. It, it can be done, and it's, it's doable, but it, it's, it's a very inefficient. So what Dave Smallwood, I mentioned Smallwood earlier, uh, from Sandia Labs, he came up with an equivalent digital recursive filtering relationship, which is very fast and efficient. And I'm going to show this to you. And we call this, uh, I'm going to call this somewhat formally, the Smallwood Ramp Invariant Digital Recursive Filtering Relationship. Again, it's the numerical engine in our shock response spectrum calculation. But it also works for sort of general purpose uh, time domain analyses as well for the base input case. 
And this is the Smallwood equation. So here we have x double dot sub i. Now this is the absolute acceleration response of the mass at time i. So we have digital data, so all of our data points will have an index i, or in some cases i minus 1 or i minus 2. And that's equal on the right-hand side to five different terms. So this first term here is this coefficient, and it's multiplied against the response acceleration at one time step ago. Then we have minus this coefficient here multiplied by the absolute acceleration two time steps ago. So these first two terms form a feedback filter or feedback loop. And this, these two terms are why, explain why this is a recursive relationship. Because the response at any given time depends on previous responses. Then we have this coefficient here multiplied by the current base acceleration plus this coefficient here times the base acceleration one time step ago, plus this large coefficient here times the base acceleration two time steps ago. Now, this runs very fast on a computer. It's very efficient. It's very fast. And if you've ever done a shock response spectrum calculation, you probably were using this as your numerical engine, whether you realized it or not. So now we're to the portion of uh, this unit where we're actually going to do some exercises. So we're going to be using the vibration data signal package. And this is the GUI script we've been using throughout these units. And I'm going to sort of park this off to the side here. And I need to call up my MATLAB. So we're going to be running vibration data. And this package is available on my vibration data blog. And we're currently up to version 2.9. And uh, I'm, I'm very frequently doing updates, revisions. I've had to correct a few bugs. And I'm oftentimes adding additional functions. So I'll make sure you have the, the latest version. And uh, by, by the time you actually view this presentation, I may be up to 2.10 or 2.11. Uh, we'll have to see. So for the first exercise, we're just going to generate a sine function. It's going to have amplitude 1, duration 5 seconds, frequency 10 hertz, zero phase angle, and a sample rate of 8,000 samples per second. So let's go over here to our, our, our main menu on our GUI. And we're going to generate a signal. It's under the miscellaneous function. So begin miscellaneous analysis. Come over here, and let's see what my parameters were. OK, I've got a sine function. OK, amplitude 1, phase angle 0, duration 5 seconds, sample rate 8,000 samples per second, or sometimes we just say 8,000 hertz. The frequency of the sine function is going to be 10 hertz. And eventually, we're, we're going to use this as a base excitation for a single degree of freedom system. Uh, but that's not really important right now. So we calculate, and we get our sine function. So we get five seconds worth of data here, all per our specification. Now the next thing I'm going to do is go back to this window here. And we're going to use this in some other, for some following analyses. So we need to save it in our MATLAB workspace. I'm, just, I'm simply going to call this sine. So the time history, the acceleration time history, will be called sine. And I'm going to save it in our MATLAB workspace. OK. Then the next thing we're going to do, this will be the next exercise here, which I'm going to, we're going to look at some of the descriptive statistics. So if we go back to our main menu, we have statistics. OK. Begin signal analysis. And we're going to, we have a preloaded array in MATLAB. It's the sine function we just generated. And let's say it's acceleration in G for the y-axis amplitude. Calculate. The absolute peak value distribution we'll ignore. That will be covered in a later unit. So here we have our time history. We've seen this before. Now we have acceleration in G, duly noted as the y-axis label. We've got our histogram here. And again, it's the bathtub curve. And 
Now the sample rate was 8,000 samples per second for a 10 hertz signal. And in order to get a real, really, really nice uh, smooth histogram, we would need to increase that uh, maybe by a factor of two or so. So we get a little bit of a jagged, this is an artificial jagged effect here just due to our limited uh, sample rate, which affects our amplitude uh, discretization. But the important point is, is that here's our bathtub curve. Uh, our sine function is tending to be at minus one or positive one with a somewhat rapid transition in between. So let's go over to our results window here. So our time step here is 1 over 8,000 samples per second. So it's 0 0.000125 seconds. The amplitude statistic, now the, the mean amplitude is, we can, we can call that zero. Then we have our standard deviation. That's equivalent to the square root of 2 over 2. Same for the RMS. Now, in a previ previous unit, I showed you this formula, and it's worthwhile showing again. We have RMS squared equals our standard deviation squared plus our mean squared. So this will come up again, especially when we're doing random vibration. But this actually applies to any vibration whatsoever. So in many cases, the mean value is equal to zero. And, th and that would mean that the RMS and standard deviation are equal. And in, in, in many cases, in our vibration analysis, we, we assume that mean is zero. And that would certainly be the case for a shaker table test. So we tend to get a little lazy and we use RMS and standard deviation, the one sigma standard deviation, interchangeably. But, um, but, but keep in the, in the back of your minds that those are two different parameters. And the RMS must always be greater than or equal to the standard deviation. Kurtosis, we'll be talking about that more in an upcoming, luma, in an upcoming unit. But for pure sine vibration, we expect kurtosis to be 1.5. The minimum and maximum, positive 1, minus 1. The crest factor is the square root of 2. Now that's equal to the maximum value, maximum absolute value, divided by the standard deviation. And again, for sine vibration, there's a neat and tidy square root of 2 relationship for the crest factor. For random vibration, we could get crest factors of 3 or 4, or maybe even 5. Then uh, the rise characteristic frequency is 10 hertz for the signal. And we talked about that on, on the first webinar unit. Uh, it, it's calculated. Well, let's just go ahead and take a look at that as a, as a review right now. So if we go to our vibration data blog, one way to get to the vibration data blog is just go to the vibration data homepage, scroll down, click on blog. And then if I just type in rice here in the search box, we get the rice characteristic frequency. And that's equal to the standard deviation of the velocity divided by the standard deviation of the displacement divided by 2 pi. Now, actually, it's a more, it can work for other cases as well. We could have any signal whatsoever. We take the standard deviation and put that in the denominator. So this could be acceleration, for example. Then we could take the derivative, which would actually give us something called the jerk. If we take the standard deviation of the jerk divided by the standard deviation of the acceleration divided by 2 pi, that's also equal to the Rice characteristic frequency. And for pure sine functions, we, we expect the Rice characteristic frequency to be exactly the frequency of the sine vibration, which we already knew would be 10 hertz. So let's go. We're going to hit return. We're done looking at the statistics now for our sine functions. Let's see what else we can do for the next upcoming exercise. So I'm going to scroll down a bit. So let's go back to our single degree of freedom system. And we're going to put a base input. This will be our sine function. Now, the proper way for this case would actually be to use Laplace transforms and calculate the exact solution. That's what we really had ought to do. But we're going to use the Smallwood digital recursive, excuse me, the, the Smallwood ramp invariant digital recursive filtering relationship. And 
just just for for practice, and it, it, it'll work out just almost as well as Laplace transforms. So let's take our system here. It has a natural frequency of 10 hertz and an amplification factor of Q is equal to 10. And we're going to apply that 10 hertz sine function that we've generated in the previous exercises. And so what we're actually going to be doing is we're going to be driving this spring mass system into a resonant resonance condition. So to do that, to carry that out, we're going to go back to the main GUI menu here, and let's go to SDOF response to base input. So single degree of freedom response to base input, and this will be the Smallwood algorithm. Begin analysis. We're going to use a preloaded array. It's going to be sine. Now, what this program, I probably should read this first. This script calculates the response of a single degree of freedom system to base excitation. The input data must have two columns, time in seconds, and base acceleration. And the sine function does in, does in fact have those two columns. And we're going to tell the, the program or the script that our acceleration unit is the unit of G. We'll just take English units. Again, this is going to be a resonance case. So we're going to plug in 10 hertz here for the natural frequency. Our Q value is equal to 10. Let's calculate the acceleration response. So actually, three curves pop out. This is our base input acceleration. We've seen this before. It's what we generated. These are all acceleration g versus time in second, at least for the first two plots here. Now, here's how our system is going to respond. So it's going to take a number of cycles to sort of ramp up. It has a little transient phase there. And then it's going to settle down into its steady state vibration. So the peak acceleration here is 10g. This is response acceleration, response to this spring mass system. Well, our base input was 1g. We're, we're driving at resonance, and we have a q factor of 10. So 1g times 10 equals 10g's. Now, this is a, sp a very specialized case. It's, it's the case of a single degree of freedom system being driven at resonance. And that neat and tidy relationship, uh, multiplying base input times the q value to get resp peak response, that works for this special case. And it also gives you a, a better idea of what a Q factor is. Now, when we get to multi-degree of freedom systems and continuous systems, or we have off-resonance excitation or random excitation, then things are going to get a lot more complicated very quickly. But for this simple case, uh, the nice Q relationship works out just fine. Uh, what else? Now, here's a different type of plot. It's still a time history, but now we have the relative displacement time history. And this might be important, for example, if we were, if this were an isolated system and that spring represented an isolator, or grommet, or bushing, and we needed to make sure that the, the, the expected relative displacement was within the capability of that isolator so that it did not bottom out, or, and also so there would be no problems with loss of clearance or loss of sway space or any kind of alignment problem. So that's the relative displacement. Uh, here's just a quick summary of what the descriptive statistics are for the acceleration response and the relative displacement response. So that's an example. Again, we've used the Smallwood ramp invariant digital recursive filtering relationship to determine the response of a spring mass system to a base acceleration input, which in this case happened to be a sine function which drive the system at its resonance. Okay, let's see what else we have here. So we're going to have another exercise or two. Oh, this is a fun one here. <laughs> okay, a channel. This is, this is actually a channel beam. It's a beam with a kind of a squared off C cross section. And it was mounted in a cantilever manner. And an accelerometer was mounted on the tip, the free, free end of the beam, and it was excited with an impulse hammer, and the idea was to see what the natural frequency and damping of the beam uh, turned out to be. So let's actually take a look at this piece of data here. It's called channel.txt, and we're going to do, do a curve fit. So first let's go to, well, let's, let's look at it in terms of statistics. So we're going to take the statistics. This will be external ASCII file in this case channel.txt. 
um, acceleration in G's. That'll be the y-axis label. Let's calculate. We're going to ignore the distributions there in the histogram as well. So one of the things we want to do in this class is to develop some critical thinking skills for signals and determine what kind of a signal do we have. So as we approach this signal, we, we, we can see there's, a, there's some damping effect there, but it's, it's very lightly damped. And we can almost just ignore that damping. In fact, we are going to ignore it for the rest of the exercise. Now it turns out if we have two closely spaced sine functions, they make an effect called a beat frequency. And we're going to determine what those frequencies are for this underlying signal here. In this case, each of the two frequencies will, will represent a natural frequency of the beam. So we're going to do a trial and error curve fit where we're going to do some random number generation uh, to vary the amplitude, frequency, and phase angle of each of, of each of two candidate or trial sine functions, and the idea is to come up with the, with, with the combined sine signal, or beat frequency signal, whereby if we subtract it from the measured data, we can minimize the residual error. And once we've done that, once we get a good, get a good curve fit with our textbook sine functions, we can then back out or extract what the uh, relevant underlying parameters were. And we're going to do this in a random number generation fashion, but uh, the program we're going to use also has some built-in convergence things. So let's go, we're going to get out of statistics here. Let's go to sign and damp sign curve fit. Begin signal analysis. We're going to have an, okay, what does this do? This, uh, this script performs either a sign or damp sign curve fit on a time history. The input array must have two, to two columns, time and second and amplitude. Okay, so we're going to have channel.txt. This is our measured data. We're going to be looking for two sine functions. Now, maybe we should choose damp sine because there is damping, but we're just going to simplify, and we're going to we're just going to choose uh, two sine functions. We'll ignore the damping because it's fairly low. And before we do anything else, let's plot the time history. Well, we've seen this before. Now we could do a curve fit of the whole time history, but Let's just do a segment instead. Let's just take this segment here, uh, just to be a little quicker. 9.48 to 9.52 seconds. Okay, 9.48 to 9.52 seconds. And we're going to calculate. We're going to start our trial and number, trial and error, number crunching here. And you can see real time how the, our curve fitting is going along. First, it tries to do just one sine function and get the best matchup it can for that one sine function. So we're going to be a little patient while it uh, does its thing there. Now it's, it's applying a second sine function. You can see we're starting to get a really good curve fit there. So, so the green curve is the synthesized curve from the curve fit, and the blue curve there is the input data, which was the measured data. Okay, now the uh, synthesized or curve fit data is in red. And you can see we get a very good curve fit for that uh, region there. We look, look down here, we can see one curve, one sine function I should say is 582 hertz, and the other is 690 hertz. So those are the two components that underlie this blue signal here. Now, if we take the difference, there's about 110 hertz difference between those two signals. And that, that 110 hertz difference is actually the amplitude modulation. So if we were to take the frequency of this envelope here just by itself, that would be 110 hertz. If this were an audible signal, we would hear 110 hertz. But if this were the, our input to our avionics box, we would not design and test to 110 hertz. That's a psychoacoustic artifact. Rather, we would design and test to 582 hertz and 600, 690 hertz. So that's the characteristic of a beat frequency, and sometimes in mechanical structures and aerospace and beams and plates and shells, beat frequencies do occur. And I just want you to start to become familiar with the different types of, of signals that you might observe in your own measured data. 
Okay, so enough about the channel data. Oh, just one other quick note. I think in the uh, previous units I was referring to doing sine and damp sine uh, curve fits in terms of some standalone other MATLAB scripts I have, but that function is actually in the vibration data, uh, the main GUI script here. Okay, I think we have one more exercise, and let's see what that is. Okay, if we go back to astronaut Michael Collins, he said the first stage of the Titan II vibrated longitudinally, and he said that was at 11 hertz plus and minus 5 Gs. So that's the, and I'll actually have a little error there. I said, what's the corresponding acceleration? We actually want to see what the corresponding displacement is, so I need to, uh, I need to fix that slide here. What was the corresponding displacement? Okay. Well, we have a way to do that with our, our GUI script here. Go back to Main Menu, Amplitude Conversion Utilities, Begin Signal Analysis, click on Steady State Sign Amplitude, which we have. Now, this will work for a, an input or response or whatever, just as long as that sign function, just as long as the function is a steady state sign function. So we've got G's, okay, 5 G's, 11 hertz. This is a zero to peak acceleration in G's. Calculate. We find out the different metrics. So we have displacement peak to peak, displacement zero to peak, velocity zero to peak, and acceleration zero to peak. Well, the displacement peak to peak is about eight tenths of an inch. So that would cause the astronaut to, to have a blurry vision as he, as he looked out on those instrument panels. So anytime we know velocity, we can calculate, and the frequency, we can calculate displacement acceleration, or if we know displacement and frequency, velocity and acceleration, or if we know acceleration and frequency, we can calculate velocity and displacement. So this is just a little handy utility for you to use. Um, it, it's good to just try out the hand calculation yourself for practice, but then you can check yourself with this script, or maybe you just want to use this uh, to begin with anyways. So that just about wraps it up here for our sine vibration unit. Our next one will be sine sweep vibration. And just as a reminder, if you want to get the vibration data signal pa package, you go to the vibration data blog. So if I just go to the home address for this, that's under vibrationdata.wordpress.com. And just type in in the search box vibration data signal analysis search, come up to this blog entry here, and then just download and install the zip package here, and uh, enjoy your new MATLAB script. <laughs> and for those of you that say, well, I don't use MATLAB, I use Python, I, I'm working on a, a somewhat similar script uh, for Python. It doesn't have all the features of the MATLAB package, but you can uh, click on this link here, and if you are a, uh, a Python user, uh, please send me an email so we can uh, start adding the functions that you might want for this uh, signal package. So thank you for participating in this webinar. And again, thank you to Dr. Curtis Larson and the NASA Engineering and Safety Center for, for their support. So have a great day. Goodbye.